the new parliament is lumbering back to life and the Conservatives held a huddle with influential MPs to sort of sort out the parliamentary road ahead. This while leader Andrew Scheer takes some unfriendly fire from inside party ranks by those who may want him replaced. And there's some introspectives going on about what the NTP has done to at least keep its seats instead of suffering that 15 seat loss, almost all of it in Quebec. Let's look at both with two powerhouses in their respective parties. <laughs> Lisa Raid is the former deputy leader. Are you still current deputy leader? I'm still current. Current deputy leader of the Conservatives. Anne McGrath is a former chief of staff in the NDP's office. Welcome to you both. All right, Hi. I saw you kind of rolling your eyes when I sort of said this was a, a post-mortem on the election. What went on at this meeting today? It was just a normal kind of leadership meeting that you normally have before caucus comes back to meet. We're going to have a caucus meeting in the coming weeks. We think it's really important to be prepared for it, to understand, because as the new MPs come in, and we've added MPs, we have mm -hmm. new MPs coming in, and they're going to get their orientation right now on procedures of the House. They also have to understand how a caucus works, and they have to understand the first couple of days, like speech from the throne, what happens there, how do you elect the speaker. So it was really just an orientation meeting for the leadership team to get an understanding of how we were going to proceed with respect to the caucus. Let me get this straight. Yes. You, there's a, let's just talk of leadership reviews. There's mm -hmm. not, the knives are out for Andrew Scheer. And none of this came up today in this meeting? You asked me what the meeting was about. I told you it was about it. I didn't tell you what came up at the meeting, Don. <laughs> you got to ask the right question All to right, get the right me, answer. Let me play this card again. Let's try it again. Is we, had a, we had a very good discussion about all aspects of the campaign. Obviously, I lost. My colleagues did win. Um, they were asking me what was going on in Ontario, and I gave them the best answer I could, which was, um, we simply put, we just didn't get enough votes, and that it's up to us to figure out what happened in Ontario. You can't decide that overnight. It's going to take some introspection. It's going to take reaching out to other members of the caucus, too. 27 of the 55 seats in the GTA, uh, you lost support in on, uh, over 2015. I read that, yeah. That's a pretty astounding number for a guy that actually finished ahead in the popular vote and was tied with the Liberal leader going into that election night. What do you think? How do you correct that? How do you get the leader mm -hmm. back on track in the GTA where they see him as a viable alternative? I think we do have to take a look at what the issues were. It certainly wasn't helpful to have a constant barrage of negative advertising coming from the outside. If you drove on any commuting highway in the GTA, you heard three, four, five times an hour different advertisements regarding Andrew Scheer or Doug Ford or whomever saying conservatives are bad. And that took a, that took a toll for sure on mm -hmm. it. But we have to make sure that what we put forward positively is something that voters are going to come back to. All right. Now, we did point out the conservatives gained seats, the NDP lost seats. You never know that by looking at what the conversation is and the buzz and the wind. Does Jagmeet Singh have to look in the mirror and say, we have to do something better in 2021 or whenever it comes? Oh, well, I think it's pretty clear that we have uh, a lot of work to do, uh, particularly in Quebec, but in other regions of the country as well. But, you know, Quebec in particular was a big loss to, you know, and, and I was part of the, you know, the orange wave that we had there, and uh, and I think that we need to absolutely focus on our, our efforts on that. So, but it was it was a kind of a two-edged sword, really, because we went into this campaign uh, with everybody saying that we were you know we were in single digits in the in the polling. We didn't have money. We didn't have a candidate slate, uh, and it was the predictions were that we were done. Uh, that we were going to come out with only a couple of seats, that we were going to be replaced uh, in terms of our, our seat count by the Greens. All of those kinds of things were being said. So I think some of the jubilation is as a result of uh, not having fallen into those doomsday traps, right? Mm -hmm. The fact that we survived, uh, the fact that the campaign was so good, so positive, the fact that Jagmeet connected so well with so many Canadians. Um, I think people were really proud of the campaign, particularly given, as I said, we ran it on way fewer resources than we ran previous campaigns. And, and, and we were facing the, 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 the predictions that we were done. But, but, but uh, uh, the road to the NDP forming official opposition, never mind government, goes through Quebec. That's how it did in, in 2015. Can Jagmeet Singh win in a province, win seats in a province, 
where wearing a turban wouldn't let him be a teacher or a police officer. I believe he can win seats in Quebec. I think he connected well in Quebec. I, I think that things were starting to really pick up towards the end of the campaign, and uh, he was doing fairly well in Quebec. And I think that we need to focus on it now. And I think he can win seats uh, in Quebec because I think that a lot of Quebecers um, uh, really connect with the progressive values of the NDP and connect well with uh, Jagmeet, Jagmeet Singh and his his story, his uh, his character, um, his optimism. And you know, there's a lot. I'm not the only one who can say this, but but there's a lot that reminds me, anyway, of Jack Layton. And uh, and I think that he has that ability to be able to reach people. And so we will have to put a big focus on making sure that he's in Quebec and talking to people. Lisa, I want to go back to you on this one in the sense that, you know, Andrew Scheer wears this con social conservative uh, badge, whether it's deserved or not. He says, I'm not going anywhere on, that, on the policy front. Uh, and are you counseling him to say, you've got to go further to distance yourself from social conservatives? Because really, uh, that seems to be, I'm sure you were hearing the, the doorstep. There's discomfort with that. I also heard at the doorstep that people in Canada get to hold whatever personal convictions that they have, mm -hmm. and that's to be respected. The focal point, though, has to be on the fact that regardless of what your personal conviction is, that you have said that you're not going to do anything to change the legislation or the jurisdiction or the regulation around either same-sex marriage or with respect to abortion. And those things were made very, very clear mm -hmm. during the entire campaign. So we have to figure out exactly how to how do we communicate that with yeah. a definitivity so that it's not a question that comes up every single interview? I was asked this question every single interview I did during the entire campaign. I gave the same answer. I'm giving the same answer now. We are not going to change anything. We would not change anything. And yet it wasn't accepted. Well, would you suggest Andrew Scheer get himself in front of a pride parade at first opportunity in the next mandate? I'm not going to give that kind of advice, Don. I think, you know, I think... But you are a good advice. You do have good advice to give. You're a modern face of this party. You can't just say, I have nothing to say to you. Right, You've got but an important I march, voice in that party. I march, right? Mm -hmm. I go in these parades. I don't, I have, you know, I'm, I'm very open. I, very, I talk about how mm -hmm. I, I land on pro-choice, pro-abortion, that kind of stuff. But the reality is it's a personal decision. And it doesn't impact whether or not I would bring in legislation to change anything else. Mm. It's, and we've said this over and over and over again. And um, I can't say we anymore, I guess. They have said this <laughs> over and over again. And at the end of the day, the country knows exactly where Andrew stands on it. He also knows that the party would not make any of the changes that were uh, insinuated would mm -hmm. be made. And I thought in a very, I would say, irresponsible kind of mm -hmm. campaign that was run. And we have to figure out how we're going to communicate around it and get the confidence and the trust back of Canadians. Mm. And I guess I, the thing about the NDP that I find kind of curious is that th they talk about demands. But Trudeau knows, and everyone knows, we can make all those demands, and Trudeau is not going to cave because he knows the NDP can't afford, isn't ready for another election for a couple of years. So how do you have any influence when you don't have any cards to play? Well, I think that, you know, you, you put forward your priorities, which Jagmeet Singh and the NDP have done, and then you try and work as cooperatively as possible to try and get those things through. A lot of Canadians voted for the priorities that we that, that we put forward. So I think you work as, as well as you can in that context. I don't think anybody is dying for an election right now. I think most uh, most campaign, most parties don't want to see a, a, another election campaign immediately, but they do want to see Parliament work, and they want to see it work on those priorities, on the things that Canadians voted on, one of them being pharmacare, another being climate change, right? So I think there's a lot that we can do together to move those things forward. I, I think it would be a big mistake uh, to be uh, to have an arrogant, uh, that kind of arrogant approach where you say, okay, nobody wants a campaign, therefore we can do whatever we want. Yeah. That would be a huge mistake. Yeah. Don't do the Joe Clark thing from 19... 80, before you were born, Lisa, of course. <laughs> I'm curious, though, um, do you sense that this parliament, given you're coming off a vicious, bare-knuckle brawl of a campaign, do you sense it's going to work together collaboratively and constructively, or do you see trouble ahead? I don't know, because I don't know what the temperament is of the Liberals right now. Mm -hmm. If they plan on taking a victory lap and poking every Conservative in the eye about a failed election then, no, it's not going to be a pleasant time in the House. It's up to them, though, to set the tone. Mm -hmm. And if they fail to set a constructive tone, then they're the ones that are going to pay the price. NDP? So, uh, yeah, I mean, I, th I think that the NDP has shown many times that uh, that it's possible to work in a minority parliament in a very cooperative way and to get things done many, many times. We have a parliament now where there are, I think it's close to 100 new members of parliament. yeah. And, and, and they will have their... They will 
put their stamp on this parliament. Uh, it, it will be a different parliament because of that. We have lost some excellent, excellent MPs in every party, Lisa Raitt being one of them. I think it's a huge loss for parliament. Um, and, and, you know, from my point of view anyway, I mean, I think that uh, it is so clear that so many voters wanted to see things like pharmacare and climate change action and reconciliation with Indigenous communities that we must move forward on those things. And we have seen, uh, you know, the Liberals uh, in the past uh, uh, take a bit of more of an arrogant uh, tone and approach. And I am a little bit worried with the way that uh, they're, approach they're approaching the kind of coming into this Parliament. I hope that there are some uh, some wise wise voices around the Prime Minister. Going from majority to minority tends to be a humbling experience, so we'll see what happens. All right, thank you very much. Yes, you will yeah. be missed, Lisa. I think I might have said that before. Thank you, John. <laughs> I'm repeating myself here. All right, thanks again. We'll see you both again.